I'm not sure if this is last week's water, but um, <laughs> it's... <laughs> looks suspicious. The second lesson is from Mark's gospel. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him. For no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of cold water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. From different places and circumstances we have come this day, O oh God. Meet us where we are and open our hearts to you. Amen. Some years ago, I was serving another congregation in another city, and I received a phone call from uh, a clergy colleague uh, from another uh, church and denomination and you might say that he and I were as different as two preachers might possibly be both in personality and in theological perspective but he along with a minister from another uh, church uh, was organizing a clergy day retreat it was to expand beyond denominational lines for the purpose of of building Christian unity, clergy unity, church unity. And he said that the retreat would also go beyond and across racial lines, and God knew we needed that. Would I come? Would I participate? Would I spend a day, he asked. Months later, that day arrived for the gathering. I had said yes. Uh, because I wanted to be part of something positive, something positive aimed toward uh, building relationships among clergy and Christians and churches. So I began to pray as I headed toward the retreat center, prayed that I'd be open to, to God and to God's uh, Spirit. And my prayer, you see, was a sign of my own anxiety. Those organizing this retreat were miles away from my own theological comfort zone. And the truth is I often struggle with Christians uh, from other traditions that have a very different way and a very different vocabulary of expressing their faith. I'm uncomfortable with those when they are slain in the spirit or those whose understanding of God seems less about love and grace and more about God who resembles the class monitor. And I also feel the tension when I'm among uh, clergy or Christians who have a uh, a ninth century idea, the place of women uh, in the church, or are condemning of gay and lesbian Christians who are part of our family. So you get the idea. 
when I arrived, my anxiety actually increased. This group of about 15, um, I was the only pastor who was from a mainline church. No Methodists or Lutherans or Episcopalians or Roman Catholics, no African Americans, um, people that I would think I was kindreds of spirit and faith. And before the day was over, I had witnessed the strange and unnerving sight of, uh, of some of my clergy colleagues falling on the floor, uh, literally laughing hysterically, uncontrollably, as if they were spiritually intoxicated. I was told it was a sign of the Spirit's inward dwelling. Others talked about the need for a religious renewal in our city. One spoke of his belief that a dark cloud had descended over our community, a divine sign that our sinful city needed revival. To say the least, my stomach was in a knot. And when I finally left in the mid-afternoon, I thanked God I was a Presbyterian. <laughs> well, one day, Jesus and his disciples were passing through Galilee. John, one of Jesus' disciples, and the one who apparently had a hair-trigger temper, came to Jesus saying, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus replied to John, Don't stop him. For no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. Now, I resonate with John, this disciple of Jesus. For he and I, seems to me, are cut out of the same cloth. He apparently sees someone who is outside of their circle doing things in the name of Jesus, and I can almost hear him protesting. How dare him? Who does this guy think he is that he can exercise demons in the name of Jesus? He's not one of Jesus' boys. He doesn't know Jesus really. I've never seen him. He's never been around us to hear Jesus teach, understand who Jesus is or what Jesus' ministry is all about. The audacity of someone outside of our circle, some upstart looking to heal others, believing that he can do this in the name of Jesus. So I have this feeling that I'd have been right there with John protesting to Jesus. Because, you see, he's, he's not one of us, this guy over there. Never been to a real seminary, probably got an online degree from a Bible college. Because, you see, I am embarrassingly uncomfortable with those whose faith is very different from mine. Who have a different faith language to express their faith. Who have a different theology about what is authentic prayer and authentic worship. I am so bothered sometimes by seeing the things I see on religious cable TV that I have at times reprogrammed my remote to delete those channels so that when I'm channel surfing, I just can't see that stuff, right? <laughs> I doubt I'm alone. 
uh, back in one of my former churches, uh, uh, we had decided to become a refugee uh, sponsoring church. It was a it was a really big step for us. I mean, we had never done anything like like this before. We'd sponsor and adopt a, a family or a couple, bring them to our community, and then support them in their uh, new life and their new land. And our selection committee gathered around a table one night. We had a list of of, of refugee uh, families, uh, people waiting in uh, refugee camps or in American embassies, uh, ready to be chosen, sponsored by an American organization uh, or a church in order to come to the States to start a new life. The list we had was from the from our Presbyterian denominational office. And it gave us a short profile it's about, for about 10 or 15 different families. There were Cambodians and Russians and Poles and Vietnamese, Bulgarians, and more. And when it finally came down to, the, to making the selection, it was between a, a Russian Jewish family and a Russian Pentecostal Christian family. A Pentecostal Christian family. Finally, after some, well, one of of the members of the committee said, bring on the Jews. (laughs) And we breathed a sigh of relief. A side note to that story is that uh, that Jewish family had already been uh, selected. And so we adopted uh, a Bulgarian couple who turned out to be dancers and, and entertainers. And they stole our hearts, lived with us for about a year, and then they took off to Florida to pursue successful careers Uh, entertaining on cruise ships, Lubo and Lucy. Wow. Intolerance is what we call what we do when we judge or criticize or condemn people who do not do things our way. I like the guy who said, you worship God your way. I'll worship God, God's way. (laughs) Our sin in this is that sometimes we go so far as to believe that there is only one way to God, our way. And others have a substandard God and a substandard God. William Barclay once wrote it is a fearful thing for anyone or any church to think they have a monopoly on salvation so I find help from C.S. Lewis that brilliant uh, Christian thinker Lewis describes the church as a house with many rooms There's only one room that leads uh, into the house, and that door is is, uh, Jesus Christ. But in the house, there are bedrooms and bathrooms, a kitchen, a large family room, a den, a study, a sunroom, and more. A house would be very uninteresting, he says, and quite monotonous if there were not various rooms with various decor. In a house, family members have different rooms which which are their favorites and where they spend most of their time. So Lewis reminds us that the church, too, 
has many rooms. We sometimes call them denominations. Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, and a slew of other independent churches. Which is to say, we should not be tearing down the walls that separate the rooms, for that would, for that would destroy the, the variety and, and the beauty of the house. However, we in the Christian family would do well to respect the right of those other Christians who spend most of their time in another room in a room of their choice. In those rooms, their, their spiritual needs are met, and it's a place where they can flourish. And that we must never forget that we belong, all of us, to this same household. Consequently, we work for the welfare of the whole house. So what I'm hearing in this, in this gospel story is a reminder that anyone who claims himself or herself to be a disciple of Jesus belongs to the house, belongs to the household. And that Christ's love encircles, but it does not exclude what I believe Jesus was telling John and us is to take a wider view of faith, not a more narrow one. It is narrow only in the sense that Jesus is the road by which we arrive. You with me? However, some believe that, that the nominations and all these different Christian churches are sinful. Or that the concept of many churches are sinful. I happen not to believe that. Rather, it seems it does give our house flavor and character. Where we can all find rooms that, that comfort us, that nurture us, that challenge us. Rooms where we can express our faith and our convictions. What we have to guard against is thinking that our room is the only room where the true Christians uh, gather. What we have to guard against is, that, is the arrogance that, that we are somehow right. And those poor misguided souls in the other rooms are somehow spiritually inferior. You with me? Maybe what we have to say is not that all the right people are gathered in our room, but that our room is right for us, for me, for us. Now, there's something else in this story, this story about this upstart outsider that I was struck with this week when I was reading it. It's this. The Spirit blows where the Spirit wills and endows us all with unique gifts for ministry. Now, if I should encounter back problems, I hope you'll pray for me to be healed. But I will also go to my neurosurgeon who's invested years in college and medical school and residency and years in practice as a response to God to be a healer. God cooperates for good with doctors, nurses, uh, physical therapists, hospitals, and all in the work of healing. 
They do what they do. God does what God does. And in the process, somehow, broken people become mended. Which is to say, our gifts are different. Some of us teach. Some of us use our hands. Some administer. Some manage. Others build. Uh, some entertain. Others sell. Each according to his or her gifts distributed by God. So when any of us proclaim that we are Christian... Our gifts then become in service to God in God's world. Which is to say that God somehow uses us to say. Uses us to serve. Which is to say that all of us here are ministers. In some sense, it does not really matter what vocation we've chosen or been called to or drawn to. I mean... Part of the Reformation mantra was Luther's radical idea that the church is the priesthood of all believers. In other words, God equips each of us with gifts to serve where we are. And one of the sins of the church, and particularly among, uh, among preacher types, is our tendency to promote the idea that... that uh, that really serving God happens best in the church. My gosh, it is those of you who are, who are out in the world who are serving God. Serving God in the trenches where people are just, are just waiting. They're clamoring for a drink of, of cold water, of kindness from someone who has, who has the, the heart of Christ. It is those of you who live and work outside the church who are on the front lines of Christ's ministry. Who are the ministers of this congregation? You are. We are. I remember hearing about a 30-something woman. She had a lot of kids, as I recall. And she was a medical technician in a, in a cancer uh, unit of a hospital. And one day she went into the room of an elderly, dying old man who was so weak that he could not speak. Well, it turned out that the med tech was also a gospel singer. And she began to sing to this, this dying man who could not talk. And when she did, he perked up. This man who could not talk began to sing the hymns, the familiar hymns that he was hearing. When he died several weeks later, the family asked this woman, the singer, to sing at his funeral. And so began her ministry of music, of song. Word of her volunteer ministry uh, began to spread throughout the hospital, and people began to request her uh, for her singing. The hospital administration, hmm, they were a little bit dubious of this. But when they began to see the benefits of her soulful singing, they gave her the green light to sing on. So she went from room to room, giving out medication, medications and singing those old familiar hymns. Now that's a, that's a wider view of ministry and our ministry is only limited by our imagination and how wide it is 
Because you and I, we can exercise so many demons by using those gifts.